do here. Hi everyone, this is Mary Curick of Front Runners Innovate Magazine, and I have with me Jerry Bowden. Jerry, welcome. And Thanks, Mary. Uh, I especially wanted to meet you because I was told about you uh, from your significant other who I was interviewing and felt like I really wanted to bring you into the mix of things as to what we do here because I think you're an innovative thinker and processor and I know you work with um, you know inside the tech field and uh, you know AI and VR and all of that um, but what I really wanted to get to is the book that's called Wish Sandwich that I think is probably significant to readers who would, you know, want to get into knowing a little bit more about what drives you and, and what, what the story of the book is all about. So I want you to just start there. This is, sounds like a backwards way to do it. Start there and then, then we'll find out about your background. So tell us about Wish Sandwich and what made you decide to write it and what you hope people will get from it. Well, Wish Sandwich is, is a uh, book that I wrote it's an autobiography and it's about overcoming adversity. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote this book because many of my friends who had heard me, heard me tell my story said, their stories are quite unbelievable. You should write a book. <laughs> and so a few years ago, I decided, okay, I'll write a book. And so I started writing the book. And as I was writing the book, it, it had more of a purpose of, of helping others and helping others see their mistakes in life and helping them overcome their mistakes in life. By uh, um, reading my book, I'm hoping others will get that, uh, have that takeaway. So what, what does Wish Sandwich stand for in your mind when you're picking out the title for this? What, did that, what, what does that mean <laughs> for you? Well, Wish Sandwich is a metaphor we used to use as a kid to describe how poor we were. We used to have two pieces of bread and wish we had some meat. <laughs> So, <laughs> <That's perfect. laughs> wish you had yeah, to so go in there. Yeah, it's very similar to the story of, which is in Forrest Gump when he talks about um, my mother says uh, life is like a box of chocolates. Yeah. Well, my book, life is like a wish sandwich. You have a beginning and you have an end slice of life, and what life ingredients you put into your sandwich is entirely up to you. Oh, that's well put. I like that. Yeah, this is, this is great. And what I really love is that you guys are using some technology uh, on the book cover. Can you, I don't know if you can demonstrate that or maybe um, show us how that works. Maybe your, your wife can, can come in and show uh, you. Well, I can demonstrate that and uh, we'll get the app up on the phone. But the okay. book comes live. Give us a few, with, yeah, a few minutes to do that. Digital content it's once it's, it's uh, scanned with the phone. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get her to do that, yeah. So here she comes. Here she when, comes. When the phone is viewed through our app on the mobile phone, anybody's mobile phone will work. Yeah. It comes alive with Jerry's message. Hi there, Jerry Bowden, AKA Buster. I wrote with Sandwich as a legacy for my grandchildren. Yeah. People have been blown away by my real life stories. They've been telling me, you need to write a book, man. So That's I finally okay. did while legally blind. My intention for writing this book is for you to look at your life differently and to fight hard for your dreams in spite of adversity and overwhelming circumstances. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, and yeah. this, that begs the next question. How in the world do you write this when you're blind? That's the well, first adversity I'm, to overcome. Yeah. I have <laughs> uh, visual tools. Yeah. I have visual tools on my computer okay. that allows me to magnify uh, the print so large enough so I can read it. So I can read very large print. I just can't read small print. Wow. I'm glad to know that because I think I'm heading in that direction myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's good to know that there's... And then I also have a, a, the, the, the uh, reading, uh, the, uh, the Zoom text is called, it's a uh, reading and magnification tool. It also reads to me. It has voice, uh, voiceover, and it actually can read the documents to me as well. Oh, fantastic. So that's, that's pretty cool because yeah. actually when I was reading my book back, I used that tool a lot. It just read back to me what I had written. That is fantastic. Yeah. So can you give us a little hint, give us a little story from the book that you like? Well, I was thinking about that yesterday. And one of the stories that I like in the book is uh, uh, the one when I was in Vietnam mm -hmm. and uh, I, uh, 
just got introduced to the country and I was uh, immersed into the field and into a combat situation and it was quite frightening. So I think that story resonates, uh, will resonate with people a lot because it's a real thing. You know, when you get into a life and death situation, it becomes very real and very scary. And, and uh, so I had to acclimate to that. So over, this, over time, I did acclimate and uh, I did become uh, more or less uh, uh, insensitive to it. You know, I just kind of didn't really care as much about living or dying. It, it just more or less surviving. Wow. That's, that's an interesting, you can, you can ponder that for a while. That's an interesting take on things. We have to think about that for a little bit. Um, let's go to your background then, because clearly you, you went to the, the military. Did you, did you join up when you were very young or tell us how that came about? Well, I did. I was homeless when I was 17 years old. Oh, okay. And I happened to be walking downtown Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, very, very uh, poor, distraught and sad. And I saw this sign that said, Uncle Sam wants you. <laughs> I walked into the recruiting station and he says, how old are you, young man? And I said, I'm 16. He said, when, when will you be 17? I said, in three months. He says, uh, well, if you can get your parents to sign you in, we'll take you. Wow. So I went and got my uh, mother I hadn't seen for 11 years, signed me into the uh, military. So I went in the military in uh, 1966. Wow. And did you have to find your mother after that long a period of time? Well, yeah, I knew where she kind of was. I knew I had my sisters, I was in contact with my sisters oh, okay. and they knew where my mother was. So they, uh, they helped me find her. Wow. So that had to be an adjustment to being that young and then homeless. And then, you know, the Marine Corps, if that's the service that you went or in the U S army, U S army. Okay. Yes. Even still, I mean, that has its own culture and own, um, structure, if you will uh that's kind of it's a serious structure so for somebody who's homeless who maybe doesn't have that kind of structure that had to be a, a turning well, fortunately a before i actually got into the military i was already previously institutionalized in a children's home for nine years yeah so in this children's home in this children's home i learned how to be uh, disciplined i had mentorship to teach me uh different things uh because uh i was abandoned and uh, ended up in a children's home. So this children's home helped me out tremendously. It offered us all kind of unique type of resources that you normally wouldn't get even growing up in your own home. Well, in a, in a normal situation, like I got a chance to go to summer camp every summer, and I was in canoe races, and this stuff is in the book. And yeah. uh, all of these different experiences help culture me, help culture me, and give me more perspective mm -hmm. about what life is about. But I've always been an ambitious type of person. I've always wanted more in life. Mm -hmm. And so they help nurture that and bring that out of me. So when I had an opportunity uh, and I was, and when I got out of the home, I, I actually, yeah, my dad took me home and, and he said, uh, you know, he, he just was abusive still and, and we didn't get along. So he kicked mm -hmm. me out. So that's how I became homeless. And then I decided that I had to do something. And then I, I joined the military. So I already had some uh, discipline and I already had some uh, regimentation, if you will, mm -hmm. in, in, in growing up in the children's home. So when I went into the military, I excelled. I went from uh, in 18 years old, I was a Sergeant E5. And that's pretty high rank yeah. for uh, someone that's been in for almost a year, a year, a little bit more than a year and a half. That's amazing. And honestly, there's not too many people that would hear of good stories, maybe that come out of somebody who's been in uh, an orphanage, if you will, or a children's home. So it's great to hear that somebody got it right <laughs> at, that, at that facility. Somebody definitely got it right and, and worked really hard to make sure that the kids that were there well, were, you know, were treated the way that they should be treated. So that's awesome. You had a family, even if you didn't have a family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So very good. how long were you in the military? I was in the military for five years. Okay. And was it during that time that you lost some of your sight or were you born like that? Well, what happened was uh, because I was in a combat situation, I was an infantryman in Vietnam, they used a, um, a solvent called Agent Orange to, yeah. to uh, 
to the for the, the forest and so that you could the enemy couldn't hide behind the, the trees and the bushes in the jungle because it was real thick so this 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 um uh, this chemical they use they have found that, that it causes diabetes mm -hmm. and it can cause veterans to uh who have diabetes to lose their eyesight and oh. so that's how it came about with me i i, I attracted diabetic retinopathy and uh, I started losing my sight. Well, does that um, get worse as you get older or is it just is what it is now? It will always be the same. It won't get any better. And uh, I pray that it doesn't uh, get any worse, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it always probably be the same. It, at times I have to have a, a, a white cane to help myself navigate. But uh, for the most part, you know, I, I could see enough, the, uh, you know, the sidewalk yeah. and large yeah. objects and know that they're in front of me or around mm -hmm. me. So, and I could see people coming at me when they get close to me, but yeah. long uh, distance, I can't see very good at all. Wow. You're like a role model for people. <laughs> I just love it. It's fantastic. So let's ramp it forward. You, you're married now and you and, and your wife, um, Michelle, are involved in Revealio. And so bring us up into that point where you're now into technology and you're helping people with software solutions and things like that. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's, it's a wonderful story of how we got started in this. Uh, but my wife started out as a graphic designer and I was more or less a, you know, consultant. I kind of gave her advice on when she was running, when, how to run that company and, and and uh, give her input on what I thought would be the best way to, to handle certain situations. And uh, when she decided to uh, pivot from that into technology, um, she asked me, "Did uh, do you think we could uh, go ahead and, and start this tech company and, and, and augmented reality and marketing tech company? And I said, I'd give it a shot. You know, I'm, I don't mind helping. I'm not an expert because she had all of the, uh, all of the uh, technology, technological background. And my background is mostly in land use development and, and, oh. and things like that. I have a master's degree in land use development. So we decided to start this tech company in our kitchen and we started putting things together. And this was in 2014. And then in 2015, we decided that we needed to be, get more exposure. So we joined an incubator in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And so we moved to the Bay Area. And uh, so the uh, incubator gave Michelle a lot of training. And I was also attending these different uh, uh, workshops and seminars and, and learning what I could, attending different meetings and mm -hmm. we invested the best meetings and things like that. So we, it just, after, time after a period of time things just started um it started snowballing and materializing into this into this uh this tech company and uh you know we finally decided to launch in 2016 and so we did we launched an augmented reality tech company in 2016 which brings which uh uh brings uh, objects uh, uh to life with virtual content mm -hmm. as as i just demonstrated with the book yeah so that's how we got started. And right now we have an office uh, in uh, Pleasant Hill, California. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, we're still growing the company and it's mm -hmm. doing well. So we're very excited. You got a lot on your plate, I'll tell you what. Um, now, are you doing any virtual book readings or anything like that? Um, webinars to go along with? I could see this being like a part, part storybook but also lends itself to be having an educational or training component to it. Well, Absolutely. that is the next component. I want to do some speaking, engage speaking engagements and I want to speak in front of young people and, and people who uh, have been incarcerated possibly and mm -hmm. uh, young juveniles who mm -hmm. have problems with uh, the legal system and try to inspire and encourage them to know that their mistakes do not define them and their circumstances do not limit them. So I want to actually give, show them by example that you can overcome adversity and you can, um, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to. You just got to, uh, you know, your, your success is determined by your desire. So if you desire success and you desire to have good things in life, 
they will come to you if you put your mind to it. And if that's what you really want, that's what you should go after. So that's what I hope to do. I hope to inspire young people, people who made mistakes in their lives and to let them know there's opportunities out there and you can turn it around. You should want to do that. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, what's coming to mind also, and I, I can't help myself when I get into coaching mode, that's just what I do. But um, I'm thinking also of those guys in PTSD programs and through the VA, the Veterans Administration, and that sort of thing. I'd love to connect you with um, a gal that's connected, and you probably already connected to the VA very well. But we have um, in our advisory group, um, someone who has worked with the VA um, pretty closely in the healthcare space, and she's awesome. And I'd love to connect you with her. There's also a gal in our network who's with our biz dev team that um, has connections inside the correction system and yes. inside prisons. And I think that might be um, a really interesting um, you know, point for you. The other thing that's coming up is not in the United States, it's, um, it's in Zambia, where there's a gal who's an attorney and was in the judicial system sitting on a bench the last I heard, and then came out of that to start a program to help people who really had mental health or wellness issues that ended up in the correction system that didn't belong there because of whatever they did, <laughs> you know, acted out through mental health issues um, or, or, you know, just found themselves in a poverty situation and did something they shouldn't have done when really what they needed is some guidance, some help, some therapy, and not necessarily to be in front of a judge and limit their life. Yes, um, I agree. Know, so Mentorship. She, yeah, she's, she's actually a traditional princess. And so we, we have interviewed her. So I could see all of the above being yes. really interesting for you. But um, I'd love to get involved with love that. to get you, you out there speaking and doing um, virtual workshops. And at least for right now, while the pandemic is going on and getting you connected to people like Hope for the Warriors, um, who we do have connections with, that kind of thing, so that you can get this into the hands of people that really, you know, in libraries, you know, in VAs and wherever uh, activity centers across uh, the United States and, and beyond, you know, with that. So let's, let's talk some more about that, but awesome. Okay. And I'm going to have to thank your wife for bringing you to me. This is great. You're very um, <laughs> inspirational. And thank your story you. I know is fantastic. Just having met you, your, your, your smile is just contagious. So <laughs> it's just making me want to smile too. So Jerry, thank you so much um, for joining us. You, you're quite, like I say, the role model for a lot of people for, for a great deal of reasons. Um, you know, not the least of which is, you know, blindness and then homelessness. And then in a, a you know, the story of you being in the, in the children's home is just amazing because you really don't get to hear good story outcomes like that. Um, but just an, an amazing human being. And so thank you for, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing what we can do to help spread your story. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you for this amazing opportunity to share my story. I appreciate it very much. And I look forward to communicating with you in the future more. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.